So I'm here with Jesse at Faze Video and Coffee discussing Midnight's for Maniacs. So Jesse, how did Midnight's for Maniacs begin? I, I read that you started off as, at 16 showing Midnight Movies at a movie theater. Yeah, 15 actually. 15? Yeah. Uh, that was in Salt Lake City, Utah. And um, I had my first job that I got was at a movie theater called Charlie Corners, a Cineplex Odeon chain that uh, I guess started in maybe Canada. And um, it was the biggest movie theater in Salt Lake, so we had 750 seats, and we would always open the new films. So we had like Robin Hood, the Kevin Costner, and um, Jurassic Park. And my boss, who was working there, his name is Mark E. Johnson. He was a film student at the University of Utah, and um, he was became my mentor. And it's a concept that. It, I'm always interested if it's if these things still exist because there's so many issues with age nowadays where like if it's creepy or um, you know I guess people have issues if you're not 20 a 26 year old man mentoring a 15 year old kid like I don't know how that must have looked but he walked me through all of my cinema basically. Uh, we would rent French films and you know obscure Japanese movies that nothing happened. We watched uh, Chantal Ackerman where movies where you just watch a building for two hours and so having a Thank boss you. like that, um, having a boss with, like that made a connection to program and he gave me the opportunity to not just show Monty Python's Holy Grail, which was kind of the tried and true midnight film at the time in the early 90s, but he decided to, you know, listen to me for some reason. So I got to program some David Lynch films like Wild at Heart and Blue Velvet, which were pretty much just coming out at that time. And um, the radio station 96.5 or something would sponsor it and we would it would be 96 cents that you could come out and see the movie. For 96 cents, which makes me sound, it sounds so old. Uh, and it was amazing, right? So, as a 15 year old, you got to start programming, and it really, I think, uh, set the stage for, yeah, the minutes. So, how long did that go on for? Uh, through high school. And uh, I graduated high school a year early. I really didn't like high school, but um, I, I wanted to go to film festival. Sundance was in Utah, so. That was great. I got to grow up at Sundance. Um, and I think that really emphasized the limitations of Utah towards, towards a lot of things, specifically cinema. I mean, even the movie theaters, when Brokeback Mountain came out, they wouldn't even play the movie. Um, and so Sundance really showed me that you could watch movies year round if you left. Uh, the place and you could go somewhere and so uh, I programmed with him until I graduated at 17 and then went off to college uh, to basically get to study study film and I was just making a joke with one of my friends that often when people go to college it isn't just getting out of the house to learn information it's so that you can go and party and then do things you couldn't do drugs alcohol and I couldn't watch movies growing up it was like banned in my house my, my parents were both sort of hippies and they always wanted me to go and be in the mountains and so I would slough school to go with Mark to go see you know go watch a movie uh, and I would get grounded for that so I think the idea of watching a film became the most rebellious thing on the planet and the most important thing for me so I guess it's a good side effect by default you know, they didn't understand the importance of cinema because now, uh, you know, it's it's my career. It's my life. Yeah, it's what I get up in the morning for. <laughs> and uh, played the Garbage Pill Kids movie was the first first midnight film, and it was a print that I had actually I'd found. And at the time, the internet was was really scary about buying 35 millimeter prints. So it was this really underground world. I mean, it still technically is, because the prints, collector's prints are not supposed to be out there. The studio doesn't like that. So um, the way you would get a 35 millimeter print online was that you would, you would, 
uh, you would go through these websites and it would say um, the invisible human directed by Paul Vacuum Cleaner starring Kevin Sausage and you go oh Hollow Man Paul Verhoeven and Kevin Bacon I want to buy that because they were trying to protect themselves from any searches that the studios would do and things like this. And so that's how I came across this Garbage Pail Kids, the movie print. Ultimately, the guy had two prints of Garbage Pail Kids and he had sold the other print to Sean Astin, uh, now of Lord of the Rings fame. But at the time, Sean Astin wanted it because his little brother, Mackenzie Astin, stars in it. Mm. And so he wanted to make fun of his little brother by owning a print of the one film that he was in. Um, and so I programmed that at the four star and Frank, the manager, didn't know, I mean, no one knew what it was. And somehow word of mouth got out. We sold out the theater, uh, you know, people were sitting in the aisle on the floor. People came from Oakland and they couldn't get in. Uh, it was hundreds of people came out for this movie. The manager was totally confused. He was like, let's open the film. And, you know, that wasn't the, the concept. The concept was getting you to see this film that no one knew about. Uh, but maybe you couldn't believe that someone had made it. Um, and showing it at midnight. What do you enjoy about programming The Nights for Maniacs? Is there a, how do you schedule certain movies, like first, the first movie, second movie, and third movie, like yesterday was Wayne's World and then uh, Step Brothers and uh, Freddy Got Fingered. Is there a way, an order of triple features that you think about? It's definitely like DJing and I, I uh, you know, have a lot of music and I feel uh, very sort of obsessed with music in the same way of trying to get in touch with the zeitgeist of the culture and uh, you know, I get into arguments with people all the time about music because music they even take more seriously than movies where if they don't like the beat, they don't care what the song is saying. So if you want to try and talk about Taylor Swift, they're not even going to want to listen to what her lyrics are because they don't like the beat. And I think that's the biggest problem is listening to my friends who hate rap metal without two, two seconds of listening to what System of a Down wants to talk about because they hate the style, but then they'll listen to you know, their amazing New York punk that was, you know, no way weird spin-off band and they know that the lyrics of that band and why they took the time to listen to that and not, uh, you know, Linkin Park, be they want to say is their preference or their taste. But that would only be the case if they actually listened to it. They're making decisions about things they've never experienced. That's like eating, that's saying you hate certain types of food that you've never tasted. And not only that, once you taste it, there are gonna be different chefs that can cook eggplant better. Or So just because you heard one rap metal band, uh, that doesn't mean anything. So programming, I think the movies are important because I know how hard it is to sort of break down the elitist walls that we put up. And elitist can be, you know, lowbrow elitism too. A lot of the fans that come out to Midnight's Arenaics, they hate Sundance, they hate foreign films. They, they really only like Wayne's World and Wayne's World 2. Um, I don't know if they like Love Guru, but I would hope that they would watch Love Guru to find out. Anyways, um, so I try and structure it where the seven o'clock show is something that, you know, you could bring your kids to. Uh, I know people have to work on Fridays, but it's sort of the fun uh, PG, PG-13 movie that everyone can have a good time at. And it sets the stage, right? And then the second film is going to be more the one that uh, could really be monumental uh, for the evening. The, the big film. And this was maybe something that um, got at least a little bit more critically appraised or at least got a little bit more attention. Um, and then Midnight, you know, it's great because you brought in enough money to pay for the night for the double bill. Do whatever you want at Midnight because it doesn't matter who comes out, just the fact that it gets to be screened is exciting. Um, and then also, you know, it's important to not just try and market it to one type of audience member. So I think it's hard with like Wayne's World, Step Brothers, and Freddy Got Fingered is that you're just going to kind of get the mook. The, the the dude, the bros that love bro movies. And I, I think, you know, people's genre 
they use genres in a sort of flawed way is that they'll say I hate musicals but they don't really hate musicals they maybe they hate classic musicals but they love revisionist musicals and so try and keep the night at least enough for lots of different types of audiences where Wayne's World is sort of maybe classic Step Brothers is kind of revisionist and then Freddy Got Fingered is a total parody So to come back to this, this idea, of, well, I'm hoping you thought of a movie that you just really hate and you don't know what to do. I'm not going to beat you up for it at all. Like, I try to bring this out in class. Is, is like, you learn a lot. You learn what what your problems might be based on you know what you can't handle. I just can't handle Renee Zellweger's face. I just, whatever that is, there's something in that, right? So I don't know if you thought of yeah, one. Yeah, I did think of one. Okay, good. What is it? It's the latest Cronenberg movie. Ah, uh, Cosmopolis. Yes. O oddly enough. It's, your, it's on your list. That's the best movie for me. Last year I watched it five times and read the book. Um, now, I know my roommate fell asleep through it. Um, hated it immediately. I watched all five of the times I, uh, you know, watched people walk out of it. When I went to Toronto, even the Torontoans were saying, oh, this was terrible. I couldn't even finish it. And, it was exciting. It's exciting that a film like that, Cronenberg no less, right? And it's, he didn't, it's not like he's making a movie for a studio where he lost his personality. This is so Cronenberg that it's out Cronenberging the Cronenberg fans even. It's too slow. It's too cerebral. The dialogue is too dense. And I think it shuts down. Like, you know, you're just, I'm not smart enough to, I didn't know what they were talking about half of the film. So I had to go back again and go back again and start to see how he structured the film. There's all these insane characters in the background that he purposely is making out of sync. He'll edit them in a way where they are walking, but then when he cuts to the next shot, they're not there. And then it cuts back and then it cuts back and now they're walking again. And I thought it was a mistake at first and then I started to see that it was purposeful. Um, it's so particular and meticulous that um, hating it I think is actually a, a good like that's a that's someone who might like the film um, and so the first thing you know I'd say is that sadly I would want you to watch it a second time yeah. and that's like that sounds like death right because <laughs> if it's really bad you don't want to go back to it Oogie loves if you get bored go online and find the letter that the director wrote uh, once it was announced that Oogie Loves is the worst film ever made of all time no one went to it he wrote this uh, spectacular letter about how he made a kids film the porn films anywhere in particular? and for audiences who I don't know what they were expecting Oogie Loves to be uh, you have to change your own dial when you go into a film if you want the movie to be something you like you're not experiencing that person's art. You're just walking through life going, I hope I meet somebody that is exactly like me. I hope that I click with some album that is exactly what I like. So Oogie Loves, I don't think ever got actually reviewed as what it was trying to achieve. It was, uh, especially nowadays, trying to make a good natured kids film that isn't raunchy. That's a hard sell, if anything. That should, that's kind of like the new Winnie the Pooh movie, which was all hand-drawn. It came out on the same day as the new Harry Potter film, and it was made for parents who wanted to show their kids something that wasn't violent, that wasn't uh, trying to make allegories for the war, wasn't trying, you know, like, Winnie the Pooh is not trying to be Harry Potter. And you would have to try to explore, you know, what both films are trying to achieve to appreciate them. Now, one movie that I know has always been hard for me was a, uh, a comedy that Dana Carvey made called um, Master of Disguise. Oh, yeah. Uh, and I was just talking to a friend of mine about it where I don't... The movie's almost 60 minutes. It's not even a full hour. And then they really did tack on 18 minutes of outtakes just so they could release it in theaters. Um, and I know that... Uh, I don't think that I laughed. I, we know we laughed once in Master in Disguise and it was an accident 
in the film where a kid on a skateboard fell over. And so watching Master of Disguise has kind of become this like kind of obsessive idea of, you know, here's Dana Carvey really trying to, really trying hard to do these skits with different characters. And you know, what happens when comedy falls flat? Like it's almost the most pure idea of well, if you if you tell a bad joke, they're gonna you're gonna get booed off the stage. And what if what if you tried what if you made a movie that was a comedy and nothing was funny? And that brought us to then another one of my favorite films this year called The Comedy. And it stars the Tim and Eric Tim Heidecker from Tim and Eric's Awesome Show. Great job. And People hate that film, especially Tim really? and Eric fans. Especially them. It played here at the uh, Roxy with Heidecker. Right. And at that screening, uh, a Tim Heidecker fan in front of me raised his first question and said, I don't get this film. I didn't like it. And what do you what do you say about that to your fans? And I thought that was exciting because what they were expecting was Tim Heidecker's The Comedy. And it was exactly the opposite. It's calling out his type of comedy and exposing what making fun of everything and everyone actually is. He's kind of a sociopath. If you make fun of everyone that walks by because that body type is weird and is that a man or a woman, is that, if you're only looking at the world through snarky put downs, you're disconnecting in such a major way that you, you basically might say, I hate everyone on this planet. 99% of the people on this planet are stupid. When you start to get, I got a lot of people who say that around me. When they, you start getting into that part, that's a sociopath. You, you hate society. You really don't know how to interact. And so it brought me back to Master of Disguise because uh, I do think his goal was to try and um, be funny. And the fact that I didn't find it funny, you know, I may need to watch it a couple of times. Because uh, I found that Woody Allen jokes that I didn't think were funny because they fell flat now, I love those jokes because it's funny that they fell flat. So Tuesday? That's scary. That means you almost could enjoy everything. Put time and energy. If you wrote an essay about Master of Disguise, I bet you'd start to respect it a little bit. You'd understand its failures. You'd start to see that, yeah, not all movies are perfect. And that doesn't mean that that's a bad film. That means that maybe it, it failed at what it was trying to do, and maybe it achieved something else. Mm -hmm. And I love leveling out all of cinema. Every movie. You, you, they're all on the same level. You can write, you can, you can like The Wrestler just as much as Rocky Balboa and find out that they're actually the same movie. One's just made through a pseudo-independent studio, the other one's made through Hollywood. They're both exploring the same idea. Um, and that's, I think, how I get so excited about every film. Every film that I go to, I get excited about. I'm not a vegetarian when it comes to movies. And I'm, I know that other people need to be vegetarians because they don't devote their entire life to it. Uh, but how but, many movies that have, you, have you seen in your life? Okay. Well, I, uh, I do, I've kept a log since I was 15, so um, recently I've been trying to start to transfer all of them to, you know, an Excel sheet so that I could actually find out. Um, but you know, the tally at the end of the year is I watch two movies a day for this year. This okay. year was, was two movies a day and a TV episode a day. Because um, I think TV series are, this is a total, total golden era. Yeah. For television, uh, specifically, uh, you know, cable, cable television is, I think, sometimes even better than a lot of the cinema that comes out. So, what movies are on today's schedule? Uh, today's schedule, well, it's going to be uh, Wayne's World two, seeing as how Wayne's World was last night, and my roommates had maybe had not seen that yet. Um, and then there's a new Hindi film that just got released that uh, normally you have to go down to this um, Hindi theater in Fremont where they only show brand new Indian movies, but they're actually showing it over in Emeryville where they'll take the most popular Hindi film and they'll, they'll put it over in there, so I can't wait. And you know, Hindi cinema is, they make 800 films a year. I mean, here in America we got like, what, 400 films a year? 
and 800 movies, and they're like three hours long, each of them. It's a lot of cinema that I haven't seen yet. 